Better at Beach podcast. My name is Mark Burick, and I'm here with my co-host, Brandon Joyner, and co-podcaster, Travis Maywooder. And uh, we're coming to you live. You know, we're doing a little crossover. Me, Brandon, and Travis have worked together a lot, coached together a lot, competed against each other a whole hell of a lot. Um, and in a few exchanges of texts, because Travis does his own little bit of real, real estate investing, uh, <laughs> We're exchanging, we became dads, you know, within weeks of each other and uh, had pretty similar paths. And he said, you know, Mark, you've got a lot of irons in a lot of fires. <laughs> and I quickly responded with, if there's one guy who's matching me for irons and fires, <laughs> it's Travis Maywater. So, um, Travis, welcome, man. How's it feel to be a guest instead of a host? Dude, it's fun. It's fun to see. I always love seeing what other people do. Like we just went uh, out to Michael Gervais studio and it was cool to just see their setup. And then I was just before we went on, I was like, oh, so what's this Riverside thing? So you guys can live stream. Let me steal a couple of your ideas, too. It's fun when I see other people set up. I'm like, damn, they're kicking our butt in this thing. All right, let's take their <laughs> ideas and make them ours. <laughs> I like it. Funnel hacking's the way to go. It's just it. I, the number of email lists that I sign up for, for things that I don't want, just so that I could see how they market, how they talk to their audience, like the cadence of emails that goes in. It's yeah. like, oh, what kind of messaging is there? I just funnel hacked um, uh, Dustin Watton uh, nice. on his, his indoor courses. Hey, to see I can spot the difference, Mark. Like. <laughs> 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 that, was, that was right at the beginning. <laughs> Good little motto, though. <laughs> and you spot the difference. And you spot the difference. Yeah. <laughs> it's like what he first started doing. I love Dustin. <laughs> yeah. There was but it like that's the thing though, is that it it works, right? Because that's mm -hmm. I still remember that. I and I didn't watch really a whole lot of his videos. I just saw all of them on Instagram. I was like, can you spot the difference? I was like, that's a good little tagline. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, first hard hitting question. What's been the hardest part of transitioning out of playing and what's been the best part? Oh, the best part. Easy. Dude, I wake up, my body feels awesome. <laughs> it feels awesome. My knees don't hurt at all. And now that try and came are starting to go with teams a lot more, I don't have to serve and hit a lot of down balls. So my shoulders fine and I'm out there. I'm, I still get on the beach. I still get my time with the boys, except I feel fantastic. I think that's been <laughs> one of the most pleasant surprises of mm -hmm. stopping playing and then switching to coaching. Um, and then the best part, you still you get it's a it's a totally different relationship that you have with your friends. And I say with my friends because I mean, me and Try, we've been good friends for seven years. We've been podcasting together for seven years, and our relationship is just we keep like adding a layer to it. And Try was like, I don't know if this is a great idea because now that we've become like really good friends, now we're adding coach along with business partner and this. Mm -hmm. and he's like, this could be terrible, but it was funny because when we went on Gervais, Gervais was like, dude, I love this. And John Mayer is like, well, who better to understand you? than Travis, the guy who spent like the last seven years. We spend more, I go over Tri's house like four or five days a week. And That's then oh, wow. we're about to hit the road all year. I'm gonna spend more time with Tri this year than I will Delaney and Austin. Oh, no. <laughs> and so it's kind so, of funny. And so it's been, been a, it's been really cool. Years. It's been cool to like sort of stack and see the last seven years of relationship building now come to fruition on a much higher stakes environment with an Olympic race. Um, the worst part, that's hard. I think uh, it's been a different kind of stress. Like I thought that it would be you coach and then you check out and that I'd actually have more time on my plate. Oh my God, dude, it's like twice the time commitment as it was when you were a player because now you coach and then you identify the problems that you're having in practice and then you need to come up with a creative solution to that problem where because you can't with elite athletes you can't just tell them what to do especially try and came especially when like i don't have the coaching bona fides to just tell them hey this is what you're doing wrong this is how to fix it because they might, they might buy it from a lucena 
Mm. Like Cam's going to take better defense advice from Lucena, but not necessarily from me. So I need to like find a way to create idea inception to like plant it deep in their minds. And then it, it like, <laughs> they think it's their idea and so i'll just i'll spend all day like calling john mayer or lucena or whoever i'm like hey here's the problem like how do we solve this and i'm looking up i'm like man i've been coaching for like seven hours today and only two of them were on the beach and so it's been a way bigger time commitment i say that that's the worst part but that's also such a fun part where the creative problem solving Mm. comes into play but i'll wake up at like three in the morning and can't fall back asleep because i'm like practice planning in my brain (laughs) <laughs> yeah i think you guys can probably relate well you know who's already built uh yeah a couple hundred practice plans <laughs> <laughs> dude i have on my desktop right behind this screen i have the better at beach coaching manual <laughs> it, it it gets views <laughs> it gets views from one guy at least yeah pretty soon we'll send that to our to our audience we just gotta get through draft number 17 first <laughs> Uh, how do you like to, to show up as a coach? I mean, so you're, you're coaching a friend and this is one of the, you know, on our other podcasts, we talk about a lot about like imposter syndrome and people yeah. who are starting a business or a coaching business. So you go, why would somebody listen to me? There are so many people who are better than me, who have more years, more knowledge, more accolades. Uh, and the whole answer is, no matter where you are in your journey, you might have seen something different. Like just because you saw a hundred countries, I might have seen a different city in the country mm-hmm. that you visited. I might have seen a couple of countries that you haven't visited. So I can tell you something different about the world that you don't know. And in everybody's journey in coaching and leadership, can you coach or guide somebody who's better, smarter, more experienced than you in terms of years? A hundred percent. You know, you, you have to be able to, because otherwise everyone would freeze if they thought that there might be somebody better than them who could do this better. You know, we wouldn't have any businesses or entrepreneurs or podcasters, right? So how are you attacking other than inception building? Like (laughs) what type of awkward conversations as a coach, do you approach it as questions do you, do you try to put them into situations and just hope that they figure it out without you needing to say it? How are you, uh, how are you getting through that? It's a lot of, uh, I do a lot of constraint training with them. It's a lot of constraint training because with try and came, we were trying to, it's not like we were going to reinvent the wheel with what they're doing. We, one, we didn't have the time to add a, a whole bunch of stuff, but I was like, try, you have one of the best passers on the planet, but, and your option efficiency last year was 70%. So your number one side out just statistically was your optioning, but you only hit it on like 2% of your offensive attempts. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, we need to make that a focal point of your optioning of of your offense. And so when I'll present a lot of stuff, I'll present with just empirical data. I'm like, Hey, here's the information. I think it would be helpful if you added this and then if it's kind of funny because like then came's on board because came's like yes yeah i don't have to side out anymore (laughs) try you can take that from me and then we see it happening in practice where i made a rule one day where they just had to attack everything on two Hmm. and they were they ended up being better when i put their tools back in they ended up being better when they could just attack on two and i was like so when you guys when I take some of your tools away, you're actually better when all you can do is try and side out with an option than if you go pass it and hit. Because then they bring in too many thinking. So I, I always do constraint-driven approaches because then it forces them to get creative w- without some of their favorite tools and they have to find the solutions for themselves. Because if I'm just giving them solutions, I, li- I really like the way that Mayer put it. He says, I present problems, not solutions. So when you give them a problem to solve themselves and then they solve it themselves and they come up with the idea themselves, it's going to have way more sticking power, especially from a more inexperienced coach. Now, if someone like Mike Dodd or Sinjin tells Kame something that he can do defensively or Jose said something that Tri could do blocking wise, it's probably going to resonate a lot more than if it comes from me. But I know that like my, my shortcoming as a coach is experience and experience as a high level player. And so I have to guide them to find their own solutions. And so I'll just take stuff away from them all the time and they have to find a creative way to solve that problem. Like it's that. it's so funny when you do take away options 
and, and then people do better. Yeah, Sun Tzu, Art of War. I know you pretty well, right? <laughs> yeah. Apparently, you know, he posted, <laughs> posted a, a new page and a new quote. But he he talked about uh, death ground, right? Death ground strategy. Essentially, when there was no choice. Like, it's either you fight or this enemy is going to kill you. There's no escape. You know, there's no other way out. It's the enemy's in front of you and there's a wall to your back. And he would call that putting it on death ground. And then you'll see your soldiers, or your team, or your people perform at their absolute best when it's either win or die or fight or die, you know? And uh, it's, it's funny to do that in, fun to do that in practices mm -hmm. where you can say, you have to figure this out. But then players always come back with, well, I just want to do this in a game. And that's the part that you, right now we're battling a little bit. You know, right now with Logan and Hagen, we did a lot of onto attacking. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, you know, like pass and, and you have to be able to jump and attack on two out of serve receive. And Hagen towards the middle, he starts, you know, kind of fighting back a little bit. He goes, well, I don't even know if this is the right thing for us. I don't know if we should be like attacking on two all the time. You know, number one, you shouldn't be attacking on two all the time. Number two, if you have to, then you will be way more equipped. And number three and four, if you can pass where you want to, regardless of the situation, right? So let's say that right now we're passing for on two and you're making yourself put this as a perfect hittable ball. You're not getting just good at an option play. Right. You're getting really good at passing the ball with extreme intent to be perfectly playable. And so it's not necessarily, yes, okay, that's, that's, that's part of a bigger picture, right? The whole on two attack. And then what's your partner getting better at? Well, they're actually getting better at transition hitting because now the pass is coming from the back half of the court. So stop thinking about this as an on two game and start thinking about this as a, this is a, I need to pass every single ball perfect. And I need to learn how to be absolutely effective when the ball's in the back half of the court. And, you know, and if do you, you treat it like that, then it becomes, ah. So do okay, you explain, do, do you explain the purpose of the drill as you just did kind of the 360 before you do it? Or do you wait until there's some pushback and then you explain, hey, this is actually an awesome passing drill. This is actually awesome, an awesome transition hitting drill. Or do you kind of wait to explain the purpose behind it? Because I'm always torn on that. I never know. Do you explain the purpose right off the bat? Do you let them sort of discover it for themselves? I'm, I'm in between. Um, I explain as much as needed and the benefits of what we're going to do. So, you know, I also come from a little bit of, of marketing, like in order to get somebody to buy in first, you also need to say, what is this going to do for you? Like what advantages are we going to get from this exercise? And just like you see in the coaching manual, <laughs> you see that like we always present, Hey, this is the situation that you could and would use these skills in the game. You might not based on your level, you might not based on who you're playing or where you're at in your career, but this is where it would be inserted at some point and the advantages of it. Now, if they really need me to go deeper later on, yeah, okay, I'll get into extreme detail, but I also don't wanna spend you know, a 10 minute explanation of every situation of why this would be. At some point, the players need to invest in the coach enough emotionally to say he's putting me in the right situations you know i see that and in the beginning you measure each other out and then somewhere when you get past that honeymoon stage then you you know you battle with each other again and then the longer the season grind goes and you don't have your first championship yet then you get a little more grindy and you have to kind of stand your ground a little bit more but <clears throat> um you go on an as as needed basis but i i always like the here's what we're doing, here's why, here's when we can use it. And not, here's when we're going to use it, here's when we can use it, just developing, sharpening a different weapon. Mm -hmm. I kind of like, uh, kind of branching off with what Travis just said, um, the teacher in me uh, likes to say, like, it, it, there's also different athletes that you have to approach that with, right? So like, if somebody is a, like, very creative human being and it's like hey we're gonna do a drill like this today 
then there's probably not going to be a whole lot of questions. If there is somebody who is like extremely structured and they're like, okay, I, and they, especially if they've dialed it in in their own mind of like, I need to be better at this, this, and this. Um, and then a drill puts them in a situation that either doesn't allow them to focus on those issues or it highlights one of those issues, then that's when they start to like, I think, question, you know, um, same thing in school is like, you could be teaching something, but then all of a sudden we're doing a project that doesn't quite seem related. <laughs> and we're like, <laughs> right. why are we doing this? We're just wasting our time right now. You know? And so I think it's like understanding your athlete too, for like all the coaches that are listening. Um, and it's okay to make players go feel uncomfortable, but knowing when to like reel them back in and like, and offer that explanation, I think is, is pretty important as well. And I think a, a word that came up for you, Mark, is trust, where there has to be trust from athlete to coach and vice versa. And I think that's what that's one of the, the big magical pieces of Kristen Nelson, Taryn Cloth, and Drew Hamilton, where they trusted in Drew so much that they eschewed all of the conventional wisdom of beach volleyball. And they're like, you know, we're not going to go to California and do what everyone else, every other successful player in the history of beach volleyball has done. We're actually going to stay in New Orleans where no one has ever enjoyed success at a very high level because we trust that Drew is going to get us where we want to go. And Drew has his own system and they go out to Mangoes and Baton Rouge every day. And what they have is so unique and rare. But I think that trust has to be the bedrock of every coach athlete foundation because it was funny because I just started working with Betsy last week and our first practice, I was like, it really dawned on me how comfortable I'd gotten with trying came and, and how I, I know I have a much better idea now how I can push came and push, try and get the best out of them and draw it out. But I'd never worked with Betsy. And so it's this like, it, it's almost like a six week feeling out process where you get a grasp of their personality and, and ways that you can push them that's going to bring out the best without causing too much tension because you have to find that balance between creating like a sense of urgency in practice without going into like crisis mode and it getting too tense and mm -hmm. that it, it's a hard thing and it it just takes time it does right it takes that that time and that trust before you can knock somebody down right you know like if you go on a first date um and <laughs> your three out of four comments are something that that person can do better. <laughs> Recipe for success. <laughs> the only person without a kid here, that's how you're supposed to do it, right? <laughs> and it's like, wait, what? I'm not coaching that way. Wait, huh? <laughs> but that's, I, you have to, you have to think about that. It's yes, your job's a coach, but, a big part of being the coach is the relationship building, caring for the relationship, and then doing your best to make sure that it's solid and that a negative, even, even if an athlete is supposed to be mature, even if they're a professional, you're still a stranger coming into their game. Now, here's the, the fun part about pro athletes is they're kind of desperately desiring somebody to look at something in a different way. You know, they, they want some form of uniqueness. So that's where early, you know, like when I was um, hanging out with, with you and JD and I was just like, have you guys ever thought about this? Not, I'm not saying, Hey, do this, even though it kind of was like, this is the right way. You know, <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> have you ever thought that maybe this position might open up that swing a little bit more? Do you want to try it? You know, and if you remember back to his practices, that's how I approached it. I was like, do you, do you want to give that a shot? And then we did, and then bang, bang, bang. And, you know, we got a few good points. And that's not saying, hey, you're doing this wrong. Hey, this can be better. It's more just with somebody different, would you like to try this? And for pro athletes, again, people who've been in it for a while, I think they are looking or hoping that somebody has this kind of magical new angle that'll set them on fire. Occasionally there is, but most often it's just a lot more grinding. <laughs> yeah. But I do, I do want to acknowledge you. And I know that you'll be like, Oh, you know, whatever. I wasn't that big. I, I do think that you were 
such a huge a huge reason that me and JD were able to get a seventh. I think one of the most overperforming teams on the AVP last year was probably me and JD and Hermosa. And great. you played a massive part in that. Because you it wasn't even just the the one hour practice that we had with you before. It was during the in-game management where you just be like, hey, when you swing on your options, you're like nine for ten. And when you do that stupid little dink back to the line, you're about 0 for 20. And I'd hit that stupid little dink on the 21st time. You'd look at me and be like, told you. <laughs> I was like, damn it, Mark's so right. But you, you were, I mean, I, I don't think people understand how big of a role you played on me and JD's team. Uh, you, like, the amount of time that you had with us to the results gained, that ratio was insane. You were with us for like an hour and you were worth like five points a set. Hey, you guys played three <laughs> tournaments together. So I don't... <laughs> you, guys, you were due, you know, we and I know, due. but you guys grew up playing with each other, right? Um, kind of, yeah. Uh, he was your first partner or first qualifier partner. Yeah. I, he was my like... first, my first qualifier was with JD Hamilton in, in new Orleans. And we were, I mean, I still have the film of that dude. It's awesome. How are you? I am so, so bad. I did. I'll send it to you. It's incredible. If you send it to me, there I'm making it go viral on my slides. channel. Oh, dude. It's, it <laughs> is like the greatest thing, dude. I'm like a 225 pound meathead. I'm like losing my mind over the dumbest stuff. I can't pass my arm. Oh, I thought you were talking about yourself. Like the now. <laughs> well, I'm getting back up <laughs> now that I'm not playing. That's another benefit of not playing. I'm like, Ooh, I can like lift a little heavier. It doesn't, I don't care about being on a little heavier side. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you that video though. It's incredible. Oh, that'd awesome. be great. I saw, uh, Janelle got to see a high school interview. So I played one season of high school ball and it was when I still had my New York accent. <laughs> she like almost threw up in her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> she oh. couldn't believe how I sounded. And it's like, it's light years from the way I sound now. But yeah. You go to a bunch of countries, um, you go to the South, people just keep making you repeat words and you're just like, All right. I mean, you know, either I'm going to have everybody look at me funny for the next four years, or I'll just change the way I say car. <laughs> Dude. and isn't it isn't it so funny how important it is in life to meet the right person at the right time in your life if i had met delaney when i was in college there's zero a zero percent chance we would have gotten married <laughs> like if you'd have met janelle when you had that crazy new york accent no chance wait 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 <laughs> <laughs> this guy was handing out three compliments That's... for everyone <laughs> okay. he knew what he was doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's building that trust <laughs> that's awesome well no that was um hmm. so do you take any parallels from coaching being a player and then figuring out being a good husband oh wow what a good question so we i just actually had my father-in-law who runs it, he's had a couple businesses. And so the business that he runs now, essentially he gets like a lot of small business owners together who aren't big enough to have their own executive boards. So kind of like a better at beach. And right. he has them, all their presidents or CEOs come together. And they're, if they have problems that they're having trouble solving, essentially they're able to bounce their ideas off each other as their own executive board sort of. Mm. And so he puts these boards together, but what he does when a client signs up, he has them take a disc personality test. And so he can understand how to communicate with them, what their strengths are, and then they can become aware of these things as well. And so everyone on the board knows sort of how to communicate with each other. And a big thing with try and came is that came would treat try how came wanted to be treated and try would treat came how try wanted to be treated. And they could not be any different of people. Try just wants to check out and not say a word and just sort of feel things out. But Kane wants to talk his way through stuff. And so we get these personality tests back. And number one on Try's list of ways not to communicate with Try is to ramble. And <laughs> meanwhile, like we're in like this pseudo timeout in practice. And for a full minute straight, Kane is just like <laughs> and just like walking through his problems. And to Kane, it's like a great way to walk through a problem. And Try's like, bro, like, what just happened? Like, and so I had them sit down and take this personality Bruh. test and the, <laughs> and the vibe at practice, just because of the awareness 
of how not to communicate with each other and how to communicate with each other, it has been a 1,000 times better. Because at that level, like the physical differences between a try, like between those guys, it's like a half percent. Like everyone can hit a high line, cut shot, and swing angle. But it's just the team chemistry and the mental side that I think makes such a massive difference. But like, could you imagine if you treated like your spouse the way you would treat your friend? Like so much of being a good husband is also knowing how they want to be treated. And you bring that onto the court where a partnership isn't all that different from a marriage. It where you spend all this time together. It's a very high stakes environment. Things are tense. The rewards are crazy high, but then you can also like fall apart with one bad tournament or practice if you don't know how to come together. Mm -hmm. And so I see a lot of, it was actually Delaney's idea to have them take the personality test. And it was, it, it was huge. Yeah. And so like a lot of that stuff, just like, if I were to treat Delaney how I wanted to be treated, it'd be a disaster and vice versa. And so I was like, I'm seeing this play out on the court where we have these like two guys who want two completely different things and they have no idea. <laughs> I go through this story at camps and, uh, and we've got a little personal development course uh, called the sessions in our membership. And one of the stories I always go through is when Janelle gets sick and when I get sick, like she grew up with all girls, I grew up with all boys that sure, for sure plays a lot of difference. Um, but the type of person Janelle is, let's start with the person type of person that I am. Um, me first. <laughs> <laughs> I love that mentality of marriage. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if, if I'm sick, me and any of my brothers were sick, right? The rest of the family would play. You would be kind of just locked in your room. And for my, the way that I want to treat it is I'm not feeling good right now. The way that I work out is, you know, I'm trying to get better right now. I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to battle my demons, get through it, and I'll come out. If you come into the room during that time, if you try to engage me in conversation or touch me like petting, I don't like it. Uh, it's just let me be sick and alone for the next couple of days, and I'll come out when I'm better. Uh, Janelle's quite the opposite. Janelle wants to be coddled and cuddled. She's like... Um, she, she wants me to make sure that I'm checking in with her and be there with her. So whenever we got sick, we always got into this huge argument. And I was just like, how, how are we getting into an argument right now when nobody's feeling good? And it was <laughs> only because every time she was like, well, you know, I was sick all last week and I felt like all you did was ignore me. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, you were sick. And she looks right back at me and goes, Yeah. I was sick. <laughs> and we were like, we're both so confused just staring at each other. Um, and then the more I started coaching and doing these like kind of uh, player development stuff, I realized that there's so much stuff that we're doing with players, so much, so many things that I needed with my partners that I never got because no one ever took me through them. Um, and I didn't study it early enough. And hey, how do you communicate? What do you need to hear on match point? how do you warm up? You know, like I, I never asked people how they wanted to warm up. And what I would do is I was, I would insert nine out of 10 feeds that were right on the edge of their capability to see if I can get them to improve. And nine out of 10 guys, are like, I want to be in a rhythm feeling confident when I'm actually playing. And so I never got that because I wanted to be constantly challenged. And so I started studying that with players and with my, you know, former partnerships. And I was like, wait a second, this is a good marriage thing. And then a few marriage books into it. I'm like, yo, this is the same stuff. You just got to ask them what they need when they need it and ask kind of seemingly dumb questions. And they seem dumb to you because you think that they're a hundred percent automatic, whatever you grew up with, whatever your mentality is, you just assume, of course. Everybody wants to be challenged during warm up, or you know the opposite. Of course, everybody wants to feel good and have a hundred consistent touches before they step into a game. Whereas I would be bored, you know. Um, yeah, so and, we had to figure another, that out. That's another thing I wanted to commend you on is when it, you were like king of helping me with all my shotgun marriages last year as a partner. I think you you helped me work through like three or four different partners, and I had great finishes with all of them, but. When I played with Avery, you had, what, two practices with us before we went to New Orleans? Uh, yeah. And you sat us down, 
And this is something as a player I took to try and came and he said, Hey, if one of you guys is in a rut, how do you, if, Travis, if you're in a rut, how do you want Avery to talk to you? And I was like, the worst thing you can do is like, Oh, like get this next one. Cause that's not helpful. Like I, I'm trying to get the next one. Trust me. I, I'm doing that. <laughs> what a brilliant <laughs> idea. Get the next one. I wasn't trying to get the last one. Thanks. <laughs> right. Forgot. I was like, just let me know, like, what have they done? Are they moving later? Are they running a lot of forwards? Like, or what can I do that I haven't tried yet? Like, have I gotten stubborn running the same outside set? Just like, hey, like, try a back set or something. Give me something strategic to try. And Avery's like, oh, like, I never would have, like, thought of that. And I was like, well, what do you want? <laughs> he goes, just tell me to side the F out. I was like, I would not have told you that. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, in New Orleans, Avery played – close to perfect so i never had to tell him to side the f out but he had to help me through a handful of ruts and i could see him like wanting to be like yo just side the f out and he's like just uh, they're running force <laughs> <laughs> i was like thank you for that information i appreciate that <laughs> um not to insert an ad but i'll insert an ad um so this isn't one of our paid programs, guys. This is one of our free tools that we have on betterbeach.com. If you want to go through a series of questions, if you're a coach listening and you want to take your team through it, I highly recommend it. If you're working with a partner consistently and you want to kind of get on the same page with each other, we've got just a free questionnaire uh, and it comes with a little printout. It'll get emailed to you so that you guys can discuss these things on your own. But just go to betteratbeach.com forward slash partner profile better at beach.com forward slash partner profile it'll just take you through a series of questions and uh have you answer things that you think might be automatic for you and your partner and most often are not so to help you guys get on the same page and for all the coaches out there who need more tools and are having trouble with their players who are uh communicating or miscommunicating this is i mean it, if you can imagine how powerful it can be at the pro level to give a, a kid or somebody who's just starting out the base of that, of understanding that somebody might not react to me the same way that I would react to me. And uh, that's an important thing. So betterbeach.com forward slash partner profile if you want to check it out. Um, also, testimonial, Travis. Yeah. And if it's, yeah, it's a good testimony, actually, Travis. Oh, yeah. We're going to really cut it. Hey, clip stand. it out. And you could also click, I'm not supposed to do this, so my, my marketing coach is going to yell at me. But click on the link around this video, and then I'll send it to you. <laughs> yeah, we're only supposed to send people to one link now because we're losing a lot of people. We don't know where they go. It's like they walk into our store, and then we have no idea where they are. Um, <laughs> so we're trying to see what happens on our website and what people need the most. And apparently there are a lot of coaches looking for more coaching tools, uh, a much higher percentage than there are players who are looking to get coached, which is pretty interesting. Uh, you know, I, again, and Brandon's the same way, and I'm, I'm assuming you're the same way, Travis, but when we start our businesses, you're like, of course, everybody wants to do everything they can to get better at beach volleyball right? Like who would, who wouldn't be playing a sport and want to go through the hard stuff and the months of grinding and workouts and reps and open yourself up to a coach who's going to help you get better. Who wouldn't want that? <laughs> we were wrong. A lot. A lot of people <laughs> just want to play. A lot of people want to smile and just love it. Just love it. Leaders, sunsets, yeah. playtime. Boy, know? were we and, wrong. <laughs> yes, but coaches, they're, you know, they feel uh, obligated to do a great job for their kids. They feel obligated to do a great job for their club directors. This is actually now a source of income for them. So if they suck at being a coach, they're going to lose a source of income that they could potentially have. Uh, so now we're doing more and more on Better Beach to start helping coaches. And now we've got a coach specific program where we're meeting with them once a week um, and we're taking them through all of our technique courses. and. All of the coaches who become members are invited to all of our in-person clinics so that it always comes with like unlimited free coaching clinics, just because part of our mission early was to help a million people get better at beach volleyball. 
And if you do help early on, we said, okay, we're going to do it through adults because adults have this giant web, right? A bunch of kids will look to an adult and they'll say, that's going to be my mentor. That's the person that's teaching me. So if you teach the adults the right thing, that information filters down quickly uh, to the young people. And I guess it took us eight or nine years to realize, hey, we're coaches. Why don't we help coaches because they have the immediate influence on players and the evolution of the sport. So, um, so we're, we've got that program all built out and, uh, we're hunting for coaches guys. So if you want just check out our page, better And also Travis, who's now an AVP coach and an FIVB <laughs> coach and in the Olympic run, which I want to talk about in a second, he's actually going to be one of our master coaches, uh, for our complete players which means that next week, so today's Monday, March 4th, next week, all of the players in our program who are getting better, who are lifting, who are doing the drills, they get to post their videos. And our coaching staff, along with Travis for this week, get to go in there and just critique, offer feedback, offer advice, ask good questions on any question or video that they post in our private community. And one of our elite members will get to do a sit in for a full match analysis of Travis's, whether he chooses his teams or one of his own matches, that's up to him. Um, and Maybe a 20 minute private video analysis. Uh, <laughs> one of our elite so uh, if you want to check that out, click on the link below, make sure you get involved. Uh, if you want to get coached by yet another AVP coach, uh, that's what's going to be happening the week of March 11th. Um, or maybe we might have to push that back, but it's happening soon because Travis, <laughs> you're getting on the road soon. Lit like the literal, I guess not the literal road to Paris, but <laughs> <laughs> hopefully I will be, hopefully this summer I will be on a road in Paris with try and okay. game. That would be ideal. <laughs> now you, so there, I, I just read your post. The only reason I, way I stay up to date with the world tour is, uh, following your posts. And so 14 weeks, 10 international tournaments. Yeah. What Damn. place is your team in? What has to happen for try and came to make the Olympics? So try and came, I can actually bring up the spreadsheet right here. They are spreads. number 22 in the world right now. And they're about 800 points behind Trevor, Crab, and Theo Bruner. And they're, I mean, they're pretty much tied with Chase Budinger and Miles Evans. Chase and Miles are a little bit ahead of them, but the point, the delta is so negligible, it doesn't really matter. What they need is just to break through this quarterfinal glass ceiling they had last year. Where last year, I think everyone, including Trump, Them. Might have lost them for a second. Both of them were pretty disappointed with how they went. And they, but what's funny is that no one realizes that the team in the United States who had the most top five finishes was Triborn and Cape Shaw. So Andy Miles had a phenomenal season and they got a bunch of medals. But in terms of consistently making the quarterfinals, Try and Came were the best at that. They just only one time they won their quarterfinal. And so if they can just get that one and a half percent that they need in the right match at the right time they can break through i think if they were to medal in elite 16 which is a monumentally tall order especially because they'll be coming out of qualifiers in all of them except for maybe ostrava when they'll have built up enough points by then if they have a good finish um if they can medal in elite 16 they'll be pretty much tied with trev and theo again and from there on it, it's pretty much just whoever's gonna have more top fives because i talked with Who did he talk with? <laughs> 7,000 points. What was that? I think we're, you're kind of cutting in and out. So it's like <laughs> I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> oh, shoot. Who did you talk with? That's what it cut out. <laughs> oh, shoot. So am I, am I back? Yeah. You're back. So chatted with chatted with uh, Theo and Sam Pedlo. And we, we all kind of put the 7,000 point threshold as that's where you're probably going to qualify for the Olympics. And which is an average of a fifth place finish. And so the more fifths are better that you stack up, the more likely you are to qualify. And the further this race goes on, I think the more accurate that 7,000 point cut line seems. I think for the American men, 
probably going to be more like 73 or 7,400. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you just keep stacking fifth after fifth after fifth, and you you th- you sprinkle in a bronze, a silver, if you win one, that would be awesome. But if Tryon came, if they find a way to just put it all together at an Elite 16 or two, they'll be right there. Because with them, it's a confidence thing, too. I mean, Try is such a confidence player. And if you go back and you watch film from came in 2016 when him and Ben Saxton were one of the top five teams in the world. I mean, he, he was swaggering. He like, he's just yachting these crazy sharp angles. And so when they are able to get that confidence and just click that mental chemistry side that was missing last year, I think that's the missing component. Cause we all like, we've seen their physical tools are no problem. Yeah. I mean, when came was playing for Canada, he was a top five team in the world. And then he was so confident in his own abilities that he was like, you know what? I'm going to transfer to the deepest federation on the planet, sit out two years, build my way back up from zero points. And within a year and a half, him and Theo were the top team in America. And I was like, pretty good. White Mamba. I mean, he's never lacked for confidence in anything. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, one thing I like seeing came his feet to ball. It's just kind of unreal. Um, the amount of balls that he can get to and, and his range from off the net, it just seems unassuming where you're not, you're like, ah, nah, he's not really in a great position. And then he kind of fires on one or he, he equips it with some speed. And then same thing with tries hitting window. He like, you know, kind of seeing his silhouette, he can take a ball from his right shoulder and generate, even though he's facing with his left shoulder closer to net, he could generate a lot of heat going forward, wrist away, cross body. So, and I remember I got to play two tournaments with try and he was always just like, I should have turned it on sooner. You know, like <laughs> he knows and he tries to feel when it's his time to just start taking over a match and start taking control of it. And I think a lot of players miss that. And I'll say that in the, in the same conversation that I'll talk about Ricardo and, and Haydn, who are both very patient, it'll come, wait, wait. Whereas Tri's mentality is, I'm taking this. Um, and it's nice when you've got a jump serve like his. It's nice when you've got real uh, kind of devastating, tricky block moves like Tri does uh, to be able to shut that down. So it'll it'll be interesting to see if they decide to take things uh, the the way he wants to this year because I think some people play a more patient game and I think try just waits for that opportunity to hit the accelerator. And dude, it's <laughs> it's so frustrating sometimes because I'm like, why do you wait till you're down twelve seven in the third <laughs> set to do that? Like, can't you just do that from the start, man, and just take all the stress out? Like the that team. They are the, the streakiest team in good ways and bad where you'll watch their match. Like we had a practice against Evan and Wyatt earlier this year. And so try and came go down 10, six and we're, and we're working on things. I didn't like, I, I kept the governor on them. And so we're down 10, six, they go up 11, six, they go up 11, 10, go down 18, 12 tied at 19. Now I was like, I can't, I can't handle. <laughs> it's like, try take what you're doing when you guys are good and try to replicate that for me, please. Or I'm, I, I understand why coaches age fast. I'm like, man, is my hair gray yet? All right. Still blonde. <laughs> it is. It is interesting to see that. Uh, no offense, Travis, but it does seem like your age is accelerating with all this coaching. Now you, I mean, you are coaching, you're dadding, your writing, your filming, your YouTube channel, Sandcast YouTube channel is churning out tons of content now. Uh, it's crazy to see. Do you feel like you're working harder now that you're not in athlete competitor mode than you were in athlete competitor mode? Or is it the same? Because for me, um, I was fried while I was oh, playing. Yeah. Uh, and I realized that I, I was giving a hundred percent of what I had in both, both directions, all three directions, whatever you want. But that doesn't mean I was giving a hundred percent in terms of actual like performance or what they deserved. And 
So now that I am not playing, barely coaching, I feel like I have so much attention, creative energy, and the ability to pay attention to what's happening in the business to make effective changes. Um, do you feel like you're more tired now as a coach or more, or you were more tired as a player? Cause you've, you've really, I, I, you've just subbed different hours, you know, where there, you were used, used to be playing now you're coaching. So what's your take? I, I would say, uh, cause like last year as a player, I, uh, the results I had were way higher than I deserved given the work I put in. I was pretty lazy as a player last year, <laughs> but I work way harder now as a coach. And it, it's hard to say like the tired thing. Cause Austin is a no. <laughs> and so it's a tough confluence of events where you have a, a kid who doesn't really sleep and you're coaching. And so like today I'll just walk you through it because I I'll, I'll get up with him at like five. He'll have like his last tantrum around five. And I'm just like, all right, well I'm awake anyway. And so I'll, I'll write, put up the so today i like wrote two stories put up the podcast and then lifted while i was on a like a scouting call with try and came because they play sam and dan at like two in the morning uh tomorrow and then i went straight that's from that coach qualifier game yeah that's their first rounder oh my god and if they win they will probably play chase and miles in the final round <laughs> like so classic oh my goodness oh that's like so volleyball Oh, so volleyball. Like everyone was just here. Um, but yeah. then I went, trained with Evan and Wyatt, coached them for an hour and a half, two hours, and then came back, ate some lunch, and now I'm talking to you guys. And so it's just like, these are full days, and they're so fun. Yeah, Mac. Producer. <laughs> hey, look who it Producer is. Producer Mac. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's good yeah. to see you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the, the short answer, I work way harder as a coach than I was a player. Cause I knew that playing like it was a fun thing to do, but it wasn't my career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now coaching actually is like a minor, like more minor part of my career career and could be a long-term path. So I put a lot more breaking up just a little if I bit were a full time player cutting out yeah yeah oh. a little bit that's all right i know you probably don't have good internet at your your uh, podcast studio and youtube central there so. <laughs> dude it's funny cuz oh, we just you. moved the wifi over to our room cuz we austin has his own room now we, we kicked him out <laughs> so, oh that's a big go. move i think yeah. you might uh you might see some extra sleep that's what we're hoping for. Last night was pretty good. So we're we're already one day in. Improvement's been seen. Hey, I've always said, if a baby cries in the other room, do you hear it? <laughs> we don't know. If you're a dad? Hey, we don't know. <laughs> That's what I tried to tell like if, a tree, if a tree falls in the woods, <laughs> do you hear it? <laughs> we're not sure. <laughs> Very different answer if you're a dad or if you're a mom. <laughs> um, Not that we're inattentive. We're just kind of in the let her cry scenario. <laughs> it's so funny how different parents are, you know, treated so differently. It's similar to coaches and partnerships, but some parents are like, yeah, she was fed. So she goes to sleep and if she cries, she cries, but she's fed, she's healthy. And then, yeah. you know, some parents are like, something's wrong. Like, I'm gonna, I've got to take care of her right now. And uh, yeah, this is what she does. She says, you all yap, 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 yap. She's chatting. Yeah. Um, Travis, I have, I have a little uh, a question. It's a little away from the Olympic race, but um, I've heard you talk a, a couple of times about uh, not you've like kind of joked about your level as a player and as a coach already, which has changed that mindset because you're pretty pretty damn good at both, <laughs> if, I, if I can say so. Um, do you think even at our camps we've been we've been using a lot of like 
video where we'll record players, we'll we'll take them through still little scenarios and then have them watch it back right away and kind of use that. Do you think that your commentating and writing and all of that stuff has made the transition from player to coach a little bit easier? Oh, or? a million times, yes. Yeah. A million times, yes. And that that's one of the reasons that Try actually thought it was a good idea to bring me on as a coach. He's like, who has watched more high level beach volleyball yeah, than you have yeah because even the matches that i commentate i'll go back and just like fly through volley metrics of their last two or three matches so then i have the context to talk about it so every match i commentate i'm watching really four matches total the three in prep for that and the one i do so i have no idea how many points of beach volleyball i've seen but it's pretty obscene at this point and so i can just pull out the most obscure things to tell them at practice, like, hey, in this match, in this scenario, Perisic hit this angle to angle short serve, and he was just killing Christian Soromon. It just went over and over and over. And I was like, Travis, you're pros. We might need to circle back on that. I like where this is well. going. Oh, you uh, still frozen? At, so he was killing Let me know. <laughs> Okay. So am I back? Yeah, you're good. All right. Sorry about the Wi-Fi troubles. Um, but just he loved that I can just pull the most obscure examples from like, hey, this tool worked in this scenario against this team. I think it could also work against a lot of other teams. And that's a tool that I think we could add. Or, I mean, just with optioning, which I mentioned earlier, I was like, try all the best teams on the planet are optioning. It's a, I, I don't think it's an, <laughs> quote, it's an option to have it. I think it's a necessity. And here are the numbers and here's why, and here are all the teams that are doing it. Those are the teams you want to beat. And I think these are the tools that you need. And so that gives me credibility as a messenger, I think to them where I can say, don't take it from me, take it from the top 10 teams in the world. Here are the trends. And that was a big thing that Tyler Hildebrand said. He said, if, I, if I've seen it a hundred times, it's not really much of a thing. If I've seen it 500 times, okay, now it's something to consider. Once I've seen something about a thousand times, that's a trend that should be taken seriously. And hmm. I am, I do have a pretty good pulse of what the trends are at the highest level of the game. And, and you can't force someone to be something that they're not, but you can say, here's how I think you can adapt your game to what's happening around the world. I think it's invaluable. You know, I like, I, when I watch, when I think about you as a coach and, and, and I, like when I've tuned into games, the amount of statistics and the things and stories that you have about these people, <laughs> like not only do you, do you know how try and came play and, and have seen them in a successful scenario, you've seen them in a scenario where they probably want to improve on, but you also have seen every other team go through those same ups and downs. What was, the cause of those ups so it was the cause of those downs and so i think like i'm happy to hear that you're leaning into that because I, I think that that's that's just really it's really cool to hear and it's a cool transition i don't know if we've had like i mean the coaching world of of our level doesn't really get talked about as much but i wonder if there's ever been like a commentator gone coach usually it's like the other way around where it's a coach gone commentator um yeah like yeah that's that's interesting because I mean, you may like Rich Lamborn and I also love the people I get to commentate with too, because I'll just pick Rich Lamborn's mind and he'll be teaching me things on the broadcast. I'm like, Rich, what'd you see here? And he'll go off about it. I'm like, Ooh, I'm writing that down, buddy. Appreciate that. <laughs> That's awesome. I got to, uh, I was at the North Seca event with Hagen and Logan, just watching their matches. And, you know, Brandon was playing Cody as well. And I was just like, it is weird. It's really weird for me to have taken Sinjin Smith's seat as the coach, <laughs> which is like, I don't, this is, uh, -uh. <laughs> yeah. But then you think about it, like every kind of father, son, father, daughter, you know, whatever relationship there is. And this is now the third Olympian whose son or daughter I've been hired by that Olympian, like to coach where they're like, yeah, I kind of trust your views, but regardless, they just won't listen to me if I if it's coming from me. 
So, <laughs> so they like try to find the best person that they think is giving them decent information just because father son father daughter relationship you know it's just got to come from somebody but at this tournament i went and i i sat next to him and i was like hey Sinjin. Sorry, <laughs> i was like hey uh just you know feel free to think out loud for the next two hours <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're stopped by a practice from time to time yeah, and what you're thinking. It it was like it was cool. He was so down with it. He he really did think out loud. You know, he he put into the air what he was thinking and the things that he did pick up on uh, were brilliant. And then the tendencies that he's like, well, every team in the world does this in transition. And I was like, yeah. I go, do you oh, focus? <laughs> I was like, do you plan on that? Do you trap it? Do you trap them into it? He goes, well, step one is just knowing that they're going to do it. These guys aren't doing it. You know, these guys don't know what's even coming. <laughs> so it was, uh, but it was cool just to sit next to them and sit next to a mentor and, and just have them think out loud. And the more you think about mentors are going to places that you, that you want to go. I'm sorry. Is it your turn? Okay, I can go. The more, the more that you like want to go places, the more you should sit in the rooms with people, even if you hear them thinking out loud, even if you hear them like talking, the amount of information that you could pick up there is just so invaluable, you know, but if you sit in a silo, if you sit alone and you try to figure out all your own problems, you're not going to get the solutions that are available from the last two decades of somebody's expertise. And Sinjin, I think he, he does such a good job of not overstepping his bounds. It's got to be so hard for him to resist telling Hagen everything he wants to tell him. So when I played with Hagen in Hermosa of 2018, and we make Saturday, and Sinjin is watching, but he's not like in our box with us, and we just get dunked on, just smashed by Troy and uh, DR or Chase Frischman. Chase Frischman. And so we're sitting there. Sinjin comes in our box and he's like, Hey, if you guys want any thoughts, let me know. And Hagen was like, all right, yeah, I'll take some of your thoughts. And he's like, well, so their approach is they both like to, to hit hard and they want. What do they want? Hagen doesn't want me. I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, he's so great. We, we lost you again on that. So it was, uh, no, oh. dude, like when people listen, we're going to get a lot of comments on this podcast because people are, if, hold on, we don't know. Maybe it might write itself. Like when Mark and I go back and listen to this, we're going to get the answer. I'm going to pull from all the different, all the different, uh, recordings. Where did I cut? Uh, pretty much right when, Exactly hey, where he was about to give you great advice. Yeah. Oh, just dangling the carrot for <laughs> the you guys. Thing. Yeah. So Shinjin, he was basically like, these guys have big long approaches. They like to hit. Why don't you just short serve them? And like, it's such a simple thing, but you're in the like heat of a match and you got the adrenaline going and your brain is like overcooking mm -hmm. and exploding. I'm like, that's so obvious. Like, why don't you just tell me that, Sinjin? And he was like, Well, Hagen doesn't want me to interrupt unless he asks for it. And I was like, But I'll, I'll take it. You can interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Sinjin's not that smart because that's all he keeps telling them to do in our matches. Maybe he's just putting it on Reefy. <laughs> Dude. It, but once he said that, I started short serving so much more. It's a, that's gotta be the lowest risk, high reward thing you can do in beach volleyball. That's what John Mayer says. John Mayer's like that's the most underrated skill in beach volleyball, period. Like good short serve. And I I am on board. Like if when in doubt. If you're like, I don't know where to serve this guy, high, deep, whatever, who to serve, just serve a short middle every mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Like, it'll work. Hell yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, you, I mean, short middle's devastating. You, you cut off two people's hitting windows. Uh, even on, like, short sideline, having somebody bring that ball from the sideline to try to bring it back to the middle, it's – the problem is you get punished if somebody's quality. Like, if they know how to pass a short serve and they've worked on it, you're getting punished and it's going to feel like, Oh, they took care of that real quick. We'll never do it again. But number one, what most people don't look for is 
was it like intentional and smooth? Even if they killed the ball on two, were they in a rhythm? Was it like slow to fast, calm? The guy had big, strong, powerful steps. He was balanced when he passed. Or was he kind of stumbling into his pass, falling out of it? The ball like passed off of one arm and then they got a kill on two, but it wasn't like they were in control. Like you got to test out if it was an accident, you know, if, if it was you just hit the one out of four that they do comfortably. So losing one, a strategy is long term, right? But if you lose on it once or twice, it's a strategy. That means you keep applying it. And over time, it's designed to work out. Because in, in beach, like to win an AVP, you need one out of every eight points you need a dig. Like you're winning an AVP with five to six digs per set. Isn't so, that crazy? That equals one out of every seven or eight points you need a dig to win an AVP, you know? And if you're so impatient or, or you're, you're expecting to get one out of two digs, it, you're going to get so impatient. You're, you're going to blow through strategies and you're never going to collect the information because you'll be too busy being pissed at yourself for not touching every ball. It's like, that's why it's a fun game. You're not supposed to touch every ball. The other team's supposed to side up. respect the game yeah it's it, we went over that with came a lot because he he wants to try to to dig every ball when in reality you got to know what you're giving up right and so i just had them do a drill and i told came I was like you can't dig a high line you're not allowed like you guys are just blocking line and you're not allowed to dig a high line and they serve it was a drill where they were just on defense for 20 balls they earned 12 of 20 when i told came forget the high line don't worry about it Oh, it's amazing when you just as a defender and a blocker, when you just give up what you're giving up and you commit to giving it up, you'll dig everything that you should dig and they're going to get away with nothing that they should get away with. When yes. you just take your spot and commit to it and they're like, oh, wow, like that was way easier. It's like, yeah, you just take the thinking out of it. Yeah, I, I do. That's huge recommendation to anybody listening, any, any amateur players. If you're defending in the diagonal, Choose if you're digging hard driven and cut or hard driven and line and just play for those two, ignore the other one. And one of the things that I said that we're playing and then a couple of times uh, when I was in your box was he's got to hit this three times this match for us to even come close to defending or paying attention to it until he does that. It's not in your mind. Like he's never going to hit a cut shot. He never has. He never will ignore it stop thinking that he might be able to um and if you for some people it's true like they won't they'll hit it once a match and then you'll think about it and you'll be like oh my god he's got a cut shot like, no he had one lucky ball when he was off balance you play the other thing that he's doing the other 95 percent of the time and uh if people could learn to just dig two balls instead of three their defense would immediately i promise this is one of the few guarantees that i'll make it'll upgrade your defense for sure. Uh, that's where I love the, the old Confucius saying, chase two rabbits, catch none. Just figure out which rabbit you're going for to stay there. Dude, you chase any rabbits, they're all gone. I don't know if you've chased rabbits before. <laughs> We're talking about volleyball, dude. We're talking about volleyball. There's a rabbit on the court. Get out of there. <laughs> all right. Um, my my producer is getting impatient with us, and we get to have some 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 dinner time. So her and her uh, mermaid socks, I've got a. Wow. Guys, I think I'm going to start using them as an affiliate code. I love it. But um, we're going to head out of here, and then, chat, uh, Travis, you're going to be coaching for us for the next week uh, with our online members. What do you think your specialties are? Like, what do you think your definitely excellent at coaching at teaching or that you've been through and uh you know if you had to write a little one paragraph marketing uh ad for yourself as a coach what 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 would your customer what would your ideal customer as a coach be for you for your skill set so you cut off after specialty and then you cut back in a little while later. Well, Great. welcome to the podcast. Good luck. Yeah. Am I cutting off? <laughs> what do you think you're excellent at teaching that somebody who is is looking for a coach, like, 
what do you think is your absolute asset um, or strength that you could bring as a coach in terms of skill, strategy, mindset, whatever you like? I think mindset and strategy are, I think, are probably two of my better strengths, both as a coach and a player, just because as a as an undersized blocker who had zero experience with beach volleyball until I was almost 25 years old, that was the only way I could have expedited my success on the beach was with the mental and strategy side of the game. And so that's, I think that's the biggest strength I, I bring to the table as a coach. And then I think just my background as a journalist and interviewing people is I can help sort of ask the right questions to help them find the solutions on their own. Like I can sort of help them explore how to get to the solution without saying, Oh, here's what you did wrong. Here's how you fix it. It's just like, all right, can I, the, the word I use to try a lot. I'm like, can I invite you to try this? <laughs> Cause he's so stubborn. He's like, I'm not running the back set. I'm like, can I just. <laughs> that would be, I think my strengths as a coach. Cool. Cool. Well, we love it. Um, for those of, for those of everybody who are listening to podcasts and YouTube nowadays, the first thing I want you guys to do is go ahead and give this episode and this podcast a rating. Chuck us some five stars. We're a bunch of volleyball bros. We're hanging out. We like you. You like us. Uh, subscribe to our channel. And then as soon as you're done doing that, send it to somebody you like. And then go and find your favorite episode on Sandcast make sure you're subscribed to that. You guys have no idea how much it helps us to show companies, to show sponsors, uh, everything, to show them that we have subscribers and that we have a highly rated and that we get you know a certain a number of minutes and hours played. So just if you want to invest in your sport, if you want to give something of yourself, just throw that rating down, subscribe to two awesome podcasts, the Sandcast, and better at beach volleyball. And uh, if you want to get coached by Travis next week, make sure that you are signed up for the membership and we are getting his master class up and running and that should be available in April where he's gonna give us a lot of his other technical and strategic tips um, in a full master class that will be in the Better at Beach Complete Player Program. So I uh, hope you guys come along for the ride and yeah, make sure you subscribe to his YouTube channel, Sandcast, his podcast as well as ours, Better at Beach. Um, and you'll be hearing some of our ads on his podcast coming up. So if you want yeah. to use all of his affiliate codes that are buried somewhere halfway into the episode, you got to <laughs> listen to the whole thing in order to get it. Eric <laughs> <Very> Dangle. <laughs> then you get a nice discount on some of our camps and some of our programs. Travis, best of luck in your uh, in the upcoming weeks. It's an exciting race. Um, happy Shoot, to follow thank, along. Pulling for it's you. stressful. Yeah. <laughs> I was telling the lady that kind of as though. a player, yeah, as a player, the stress is practice. You're like, ah, oh, it's kind of a grind. The tournaments are the fun part. The coaching is the opposite. We're practicing. I'm like, cool, like we're solving problems today. We're working. Then tournaments, I'm like, I can't do anything. I'm like freaking out over here. <laughs> but I appreciate all the kind words, boys. I appreciate you having me on. It's fun to be a guest on the podcast. Yeah, man. We love you, buddy. Um, good luck, kick some butt, and uh, we will see you on the sand. Shoots, boys. <laughs>